That's true. All other countries hate our freedom. Welcome everybody and thank you for joining me for another video. My name is Jeffrey Ramos and today we'll be watching Six Lies America Told Me About Europe. Let's watch. This video, we're going to talk about a couple lies that the United States pushes into us as Americans growing up. And let's talk about it right now. Let's get to it right now. Okay, Lie let's get number to it. one. This one is a funny one to me because in the United States, it's always, I don't care if you're a de Democrat, I don't care if you're a Republican, I don't care if you're independent, I don't care where you're at on the political spectrum. You're always going to have a politician telling you that they hate our freedoms, our freedom of religion, our freedom of speech, our freedom to vote and assemble and disagree with each other. <laughs> That's right. They hate us for our freedoms. Can you believe that? As if nowhere else in the world That's right. has any freedoms. Like Europe, you know, in Europe they act like, you know, they act like if you come to Europe, there's just no freedoms. What freedoms do I not have here in Europe? You know, as these are Western democracies with Western values and culture that has been exported to the United States and it's become its own thing. I'm not saying one is better than the other, but freedoms exist here. I'm still trying to, I'm still scratching my head. What freedom do you have in America that I don't have here? Let's talk about freedom of speech, for example. In America, you have freedom of speech. In the UK, for example, you don't have freedom of speech. What you do have is freedom of expression. Slight different tweak, but let's give you an example. In America, you can be as racist as you want to somebody. You can walk up to me, Keyboard warriors. walk up to any black person and say the N-word all day long if you want. Where in the UK, you really couldn't do that. Because at some point, you will cross a fine line of inciting racial hatred. And get knocked out. So if you define your freedoms based on your ability to call somebody an N-word or call some uh, Asian American some type of offensive word, by all means, you can have that freedom. I don't need that freedom. But other people in America talk about it like freedom for guns. <laughs> That's true. All other countries hate our freedom because you see, they're just not free enough because obviously they aren't free and they don't know what freedom is like. It's also funny that we have freedom of speech, but we are often silenced because the social media outlets where we choose to exercise that freedom are privately owned. So they mediate what stays and what goes in their outlets. Therefore, is it really freedom of speech or is it just okay as long as you agree with their values? And outside of social media, yes, we have their freedom, but most people won't exercise that, right? Because they are scared of being punched in the face. Take, for example, the N-word. Some people are quick to throw it around online, but if they know that if they say that in real life, they'll get punched in the face. Other ramifications might be you get fired from work if you don't have the anonymity that comes with being online. Ooh, guns, guns, guns. They want to take your guns. Well, let's see. Here in the UK, can you have guns? Yes. yes. Can you have a rifle? Yes. Can you have a handgun? Yes. What does the Second Amendment say in the United States? It has to be, it's highly regulated. So what is it here in the UK? Guess what? It's highly regulated. There's lots of regulations around what type of gun, where you have to store that gun, where you have to keep the ammunition, what do you have to do for the maintenance of that gun? Highly regulated. Yes. But do you guys across the pond get a handgun with every bottle of whiskey that you buy? I think not. You know why? Because you're not free enough. So you still have the freedom to have a gun. So if you define your freedoms as being able to have as many guns as you want in America, okay, fine, no argument. But I think that's a lie that they sell that nobody here has any guns. Not true. Number. I think the assumptions that you're not allowed to have guns in Europe comes from the belief that um, since certain guns are banned, let's say in Great Britain, then you're not allowed to have any guns in Europe because, you know, some of us think that Great Britain is the only thing in Europe, they, that it's the entire European continent. Because most of us are so smart. Number two. Social housing is a bad thing. 
It's something that you're supposed to segregate from the rest of the population. So, for example, in America, especially in L.A. where I'm from or Southern California where I'm from, social housing, Section 8. Well, that's usually in a separate side of the city, not being seen. I don't even know where it's at because where I grew up was nothing but beautiful homes, single family homes, no social housing. Where here in the UK, just in Europe in general, it's all sprinkled around you. For example, here in the UK, I live in a beautiful big house, beautiful executive style estate. I have a nice car, but guess what? On this estate and on several new estates, they all have social housing and they do things that are different in the United States or that they do here in the UK that they wouldn't do or they don't do in the United States. You could be on social housing, but guess what? You can partially own that house. So that way you can be on the track. So you can buy 10% of the home, 20% of the home, wow. 50% of the home, and try to get all the way up to 100% of the home like me or you do. So that's a different strategy that they do so that social housing is good for everybody because that way the kids get to interact with all people from all social and religious economic backgrounds. And you as an adult get to work and meet and mingle with people from all different backgrounds. I think the neighborhoods are better for it, they're safer for it, less crime, because guess what? If you're in an executive style estate, well, guess what? You want to keep your home value high. You want to keep it nice and looking new. And that's going to put pressure on the social housing to also keep their house nice, keep the estate looking nice and new and fresh. So I think that's a myth. And I think that's something that should be revisited in the United States. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Over here, this is stigma that comes with Section 8 living and social housing. Because over here, some people do not want to live next to other people that are not doing as well as they are because they have a very me, me, me mentality. And the fact that you can own certain percentage of that social housing, it's amazing. Some people strive to own their own home. And if you could buy that property in increments, that would do wonders for them. I mean, that would make it so much easier to own the place that you live in just stop paying rent and start um, investing in yourself. Not to mention having your kids mix with other kids from different economic status might help your kids strive to do better and change their mentality. We know that kids emulate things they see every day. So if your kid sees twerking and struggle every single day, well, they might just emulate that. I mean, most of the time at least. Number three, in America they teach you this, that somehow being a hard worker means coming in early, Staying late, never taking a vacation, and definitely don't call in sick. That is like the biggest mistake you could ever make, faux pas you can make. I'll give you an example. When I was working for a large airframe manufacturer in the United States, I remember a friend of mine, we wanted to take two weeks off and go do something. Our managers looked at us like we were crazy because we wanted to have the audacity to take two weeks off. How dare you? And mind you, we didn't have, we didn't take any days off prior to that. We just wanted to take two weeks off in a year so we could go do something. They were like, no, <laughs> reject it, slim that down to a week. And I'm thinking, isn't that my time off to relax, to recharge my battery so I can come back to work? No. Now I think minds and hearts have changed a little bit in the United States back from when I started working back in the early 2000s or mid 2000s, I should say. But that was a faux pas. Well, here in the United Kingdom and here in Europe, for example, it's encouraged to take time off. You get 20, 25 plus days off in mostly all European countries. I think by law in, in the European Union, you have to have 20 days off. So it's encouraged to take time off because either you use it or you lose it. And for example, I think Sweden, if I can find the article, it's on the screen now. But if not, Sweden is actually doing a trial where they're reducing the work hours to six hours to see if it increases productivity because employees, employers are seeing that the employees are more rested and more focused when they come back to work. Number. Definitely agree. I feel that a work personal life balance is essential for peak performance in both your work environment and your personal life. If your work, measures your value by just the time that you put in instead of the quality of work that you put in then maybe it's just not the best place for you just maybe and if you want to take some time off you should be able to do it imagine being so burned out because you can't take time off that you dread going into work 
Nothing hurts productivity more than you dreading to go into the office or wherever you may work. Four, America sells you this, that capitalism and consumerism go hand in glove. It's like this cycle. You have to work, to buy, to work again, to pay for what you buy, to buy some more stuff, to then work again and go down this continuous loop of working to live. And in Europe, one of the things that I find I think is a, is a beauty and a benefit of working and living in Europe is that there's more of a work-life balance. As I just talked about in point number three, is that you have time off to actually do stuff. And you don't just have this endless working to consume. Don't get me wrong. We go on vacation, so we're consuming what I would call, um, we are consuming experiences, but we, we are not, we don't live to work. We work to live. And that is a benefit of living in Europe. And I think that is great. And I think the U.S. sells a lie to its people by telling them that you have to work hard to then buy stuff and never do anything. Hmm. I feel like that's a conflicting point. Yes, you shouldn't be at work all the time just so you can earn some money to go and spend it on some Jordans or the new iPhone or whatever. But I also don't think that you should feel like your old things and then just because you shouldn't be working hard to acquire the things that you want that you should just sit back and say well I don't want to work for this but then I feel like I am old that like I should have the new iPhone though I don't want to put in the same work as this person did so again you shouldn't work solely just to buy things but then you shouldn't get lazy either and not work hard towards the thing that you want to achieve. So then again, that's that's a hit or miss for me. Five, which kind of ties into the first one I said, but it really is on the Republican right side in America. They always preach, especially during the Obamacare era, 2012, was all about these death panels. They literally produced a video where they were throwing grandma off a cliff because of Never remember those. medicine. <laughs> you got you got Obamacare grandma? Well guess what? Off the cliff you go. Make no mistake about it. President Obama and the Democrats who supported Obamacare began throwing seniors off the cliff back. The evils of social <laughs> medicine that you were gonna have to have <laughs> death panels. If you got sick, I mean, how ridiculous of a lie that is. I mean, it's a bold faced lie. I've lived here 11, 12 years. I have yet to ever see a death panel. I have known some older people. I know some younger people. I know myself. You can walk into any hospital in any country in Europe and there's not a single death panel. What do you expect them to say? Oh, sorry, you had a heart attack last year, Mr. Carl, but. Um, since you had one last year, we're not going to treat you for this heart attack. Off the cliff you go. the panel has refused your care. On a side note, you kind of already have that in America. You just have it through the insurance companies because guess what they do? Decide not to cover Denied. You. They say it's a pre-existing condition. I don't think you can do that anymore, but they'll say that. Or they'll find a way to deny coverage. They'll make it so high to cost to do it that you have to do it out of pocket and guess what now you're bankrupt so that loops right back to number one how are you free if you have to live with the pressure of going bankrupt and not being able to pay your bills because guess what you have the audacity to break your hip get sick i don't know you pick it so those are the five things that i think that the united states lies all right. I don't know if that's so much of a political issue that's not Republican versus Democrat because, let's face it, they're all full of crap. But more of an insurance monopoly issue. But that's that's a huge topic for another day. That's too big to cover in one video. Unfortunately, it's true. Some people get sick, like, God forbid, a family member, your spouse or something got cancer and you have to pay for all these drugs out of pocket that are no longer covered by your insurance. And... You'll be having to sell things that, oof, it's, it's tough. Jeez. I'm going to leave you with a bonus one, which is kind of strange if you look at it. Because number six is this. 
in America every day, all students around the nation get up every morning and say the Pledge of Allegiance. You pledge yourself and align yourself to the United States flag and to the republic for which it stands. Now, that's not something that's common in Europe. In many Western countries, I don't know of any other Western country that makes its kids get up every morning. I do know of one back in 1938, 1942-ish time. Those kids used to get up and actually pledge allegiance to their flag and to their Fuhrer. But I don't know if that's something we should necessarily be doing. Don't get me wrong. I love my country. I'm very patriotic about it. I love the 4th of July for all its, my country is never perfect, but I think it can get better. But Probably that's mine. Better. Hit me in the comments. Tell me what you think. Oh, that sweet Pledge of Allegiance. Um, that's been a source of controversy for me for a long time. Back in high school, they used to make it recite it every single morning. And some kids would get in trouble for not doing it. And I never understood why they would get in trouble. But you bet your sweet behind that I know now. But back then, it used to be like, let him, if they don't want to say it, let him not say it. But, you know, off to the principle if you don't recite that Pledge of Allegiance. It's no secret that America likes to keep their citizens in their little bubble. We are free. And if, you don't, if somebody's telling you that you are not free, then they just hate your freedom. We make a lot of generalizations, not just with the freedom of speech or just being free altogether, but with a lot of other things, too. Just like Biden says. If you didn't vote for me, you're not black. Okay. That still makes me laugh. But yes, it is ridiculous to think that other countries have no freedom. But as far as some people here are concerned, America occupies 80% of the land in the entire world. And all other countries are just small pieces of land that are sprinkled around in the ocean that have no freedom. And they hate our freedom. Anyways, I'm going to go have a drink now. I'll see you in the next video. Peace.